hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining the 14th presentation event of BA Slash. I'm Monique Cole, a management consultant at BA Systems Supply Intelligence, helping organizations with their digital products, innovation, transformation, and cybersecurity. I started the BA Slash community at the start of the COVID. The aim is to connect people with different expertise and insights for the evolving needs of the market. We also have Marianne and, and Pam as the organizers. Marianne has some really urgent issues to manage this evening, but we still have Pam here. So Pam, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name's uh, Pam Inda. Uh, I have been a BA for about, in the BA space for about 15 years. And um, prior to that, um, I have been a developer as well. I'm currently working for Shell on a KYC uh, project, uh, implementing uh, a new tool to kind of do all of the onboarding and updating with regard to their counterparty data um, to get some key things like speed, efficiencies, and just generally management information. So, yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. That's me. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And uh, a special thank you actually to to Adam. Uh, he he has been our um, organizer for for the the past year, and even he sort of left the organizing team, but he is really kind to to let, let us use the Zoom facility, and that's really good just to to keep the cost low. And we we do um, run this community in a voluntary basis. So so yeah. So any help would would really support the community to grow. So thank you as well. And if you like BA Slash as the mission or the content that we are producing, please sh uh, spread the words with your colleagues, your contacts, tweet us, follow us on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Every post that you make, every tweet that you make uh, makes, makes us go further. We can reach more people. I have kicked off the, the Manti link um, before the recording, but essentially we are just asking people what's the biggest value of negotiation that you have performed in life so far. And I'll just reshare the link very quickly on the chat. So I will be really interested to know how what's the, the biggest things that you guys have done. Um, just go through some logistics housekeeping points. So you will receive the, the slide backs and the recording of this section in a couple of days. And your line is muted right now because we are doing our recording, but feel free to unmute your line when we get into the Q&A and also in the discussion section later. You can also put your questions in the chat box where Pam will collate all the questions and ask them towards the end. And of course you can, as I said, unmute your line and ask questions towards the end. That's no problem at all. Last but not least, you are very welcome to stay behind for the networking and all these. I'll be around. So just a, a quick show of hands um, or emoji uh, from you to this question. So how many of you have not done any presentation in a community like this or in a forum or in a conference before? Any, anyone? So everyone has done something. Okay, so, so my next question is, why don't you do one for BA Slash? I know Sally has done one, but we, and, and I know Gary is going to do one today, but yeah, but we definitely want more insights uh, of different topics from you. So please contact us and we can shape together a presentation that you can share your stories for the audience in this community. And bear in mind, this is not a forum just for business analysts. This, the BA slash forum is more to get um, people to learn more about business analysis techniques. And we are constantly bringing in different capabilities and different expertise areas. So yeah, so do be generous, share your, your knowledge with the others. Yeah. And for those who have really have never done any sharing before, in a public space like this, the organizing team, we are here to help you to sharpen your presentation techniques. We are all, all here for you. So, so do contact us, make your biggest impact, and you can join as the organizer, share our events, share recording as usual. Uh, today, it's really great to have Gary to share his learning and experience of negotiation. 
we picked this topic with Gary because, as I mentioned, BA Slash is not just a platform for business analysis techniques, it's also for some transferable skills. And I do find negotiation is something that some people have been doing really well on, but some people, they, they would be like, oh, that's not something for me to, to, to do, or it's not required. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an account manager. I don't need to do it. But you, essentially, in our daily life, we do negotiation all the time. So it would be great to have Gary to tell us more about the steps of negotiation, the science behind and all these. And please, Gary, uh, introduce yourself and you can kick start. OK, thank you, Monique. Uh, so as been said, my name is Gary Holmes. I'm currently a principal consultant with Emphasis Consulting. I've been in IT and business for 45 years this year, and I've been in most IT roles at one point or another. Um, I've also had the great fortune to be managing director of five companies, and uh, that's where, I, in one particular area, where I've uh, had the opportunity to learn and practice lots of negotiating skills, including at one point in my career, uh, selling a business. And it wasn't mine. Uh, if it had been, uh, I'd have been running this presentation from a beach in the Caribbean somewhere. So um, let's move on and talk about negotiating skills for life. And in some of the introduction to this, I think there was a discussion around, is it an art or is it a science? And it's a little bit of both. And we'll cover some of that as we go through this session. There are also uh, people's preconceived ideas around what negotiating is, is about. And as Monique mentioned, some people think it's about sales. Some people think it's only about money. Some think people think it's about cutting a deal. Some think people think it's even about getting a deal best for yourself, um, better than anyone else could, could have done. And it's not about those things. It's much more, as we look at on the next slide, it, it's all about the a particular way that we influence people. When you're going through a negotiation, it's, it's about not just getting what you want, but giving up a little bit of some of the things that you might have wanted in return for some of the things that you desperately need. And the secret to any successful negotiation is making sure that it is a fair and equitable outcome. Because if you negotiate and you push someone so far, they go beyond a deal that they would consider to be reasonable. And yet they felt maybe boxed in and they had no choice but to agree it. They walk away from that negotiation, um, having two things going on in their mind. One is lack of motivation to deliver on the deal that they've just agreed with you. So it's unlikely to be successful from that point of view and a significant lack of desire to ever want to negotiate with you again because they're going to be feeling bad about the process. So it's absolutely critical to be thinking about the long term relationships that we have with people in business. And therefore, we want an outcome that is appropriate and acceptable to both parties. Because this is not about being on different sides. This is about being on the same side and getting an outcome that is right for us. Now, it's different if you're selling your car and you're selling it privately and all you want to do is get the best possible price and you don't care if it breaks down five minutes down the road. You know, if you do that, go and get the best deal that you possibly can because you're never likely to have to deal with that person again and all you've got to live with is your own conscience. However, in other walks of life and particularly in business, we are going to have to deal with people again and again and again and therefore having a successful outcome is as much about enhancing the relationship as it is about the agreement that you reach between the two of you. So it is about influences about people. It can be about time in the projects that we work on, trying to negotiate extra time or a different time frame. It can be about the requirements as, as a business analyst, you're constantly talking to people about requirements and those requirements come with a priority in people's head. And if they can't have everything they would like, then maybe you negotiate with them for the things that they can have and you separate out the wants versus their needs and therefore it becomes about priorities in people's mindsets so if we focus on those side that side of it uh, we're much more likely to be successful the next slide please monique so when we're going to negotiate um, we've got to be thinking about the precursors to successful negotiation as these are simple things uh, one is about having relationships uh, as I've already said, this is about relationships and you can't negotiate if you haven't invested in that relationship first. 
It's like having a bank account. You can't draw out money if you haven't invested into it in the first place. And when we are negotiating with people, we are withdrawing a little bit of the goodwill that we built up in that relationship. It's also about trust. Because if someone doesn't trust you, they're not going to be willing to negotiate. They won't be prepared to necessarily reveal their um, requirements for that negotiation. They'll be playing their cards close to their chest. And that, again, makes it a very difficult situation for us to be in. Good negotiations are about openness. And openness can only come about if you've got trust. And then lastly, it's about power. And we have to be negotiating from a position of power. So let's have a look at these three in a little bit more detail. But first, we'll touch on the um, relationships. This is very much where it's about a, a science in terms of developing the skill, but an art in the application of the skill. And we've all got this. By being a human being, we, ha we have the capacity to build relationships. But we need to be clear about why we want this relationship. Where is it headed? And therefore, what do we need to make sure that we protect in the context of any kind of negotiation and in that relationship making sure that we understand people's personalities because the more you understand about their personality the more you can use that knowledge and information during the negotiation process some people are reflectors and so they like to have a whole load of information they'll go away and absorb it and reflect on it and then they'll come back and if you've got an individual like that you're dealing with what's the point in trying to negotiate in a half an hour meeting it won't be successful they won't be in that mental place for them to reach an agreement with you because they won't have had a chance to absorb the information. There'll be other people who are very, very visually oriented that you deal with. And therefore, if you're going to present information to them during the negotiation, make it visually stimulating. There'll be other people that would like to be more auditory in their approach and they'll respond well to stories and anecdotes about why arriving at a successful outcome is important. So if you understand about their personality, if you understand their, their likes and dislikes and their thinking and decision making style and what it is that um, drives them to do whatever it is that they do, and you can identify a benefit to them. If there's no benefit from concluding the negotiation with you, then what's the motivation for them? So you've got to put, put yourself in their shoes. And then finally, there'll be this aspect of timing preferences. Some people are morning people, some people are afternoon people. And if you want to get someone when they're at their best, which is when you want to negotiate with them, knowing that about them is important. So there's a lot of things for us to do in advance of a successful negotiation to set up that relationship. And then we can leverage all those things to our advantage and to the other person's advantage. They won't be getting in the way. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this takes us on to the aspects of trust. And when we're thinking about trust, this one's got some builds um, go through. So there is, there's some things that we need to think about here. It's not binary. Trust is never binary. And people think about it like that. You either trust someone or you don't trust someone. But actually, it's not like that. I've got a nephew who, who's now 23. And uh, he's always been fanatical about cars. And a number of years ago, I purchased a, a very high-powered car. It was a you know, one of these uh, midlife crisis things that I've uh, been through. We all, we all have those types. And if Craig had said to me, uh, that's my nephew's name, if he'd have said to me, Gary, can I borrow your car keys? I'd have said, no, it's not that I don't trust him. It's just that, you know, as a youngster, maybe 18, 20 years old, he won't have had the opportunity to experience that kind of vehicle. And to give it to him on a public road just would not have been safe for him and for other people. But had he wanted my little run around, of course, I would have thrown him the keys and said, you know, bring it back when you're ready. It's not about having a trust or not trust. It's the spectrum. And as you look at the circumstances and the situation that you find yourself in, and then you determine how much you can trust someone around that particular situation. And the next one, please, Monique. Uh, there's also a really strong um, leadership case and business case for building trust. Leadership case, because if people... Uh, trust the leadership that you're providing. They're much more willing to want to go in that direction. And there is a business case for trust. You can actually demonstrate that organizations and individuals who operate in a high trust environment will definitely be more successful than those that don't. Uh, next one, please, Monique. And it is a learnable competency. There are things that we can do 
to, uh, and, and I'll touch on some of it today. There's been lots of books written about this as well. There are things that we can do to learn to accelerate the pace at which we build up trust with others. And that, and that takes us into the next bullet on here, please. Um, so think about your own personal brand, the reputation that you've got, whether that be the reputation that you've got in your company or in the wider community that you're part of, or in the wider industry in general, depending on the, the scale and scope of where that brand reaches out to. That's going to start to set in people's mind a number of parameters about just how far they can trust you. Uh, the next bit on there. So when we're thinking about building trust, there's a simple little model. First of all, you want to declare your intent. You want to make sure that the other person that you're dealing with, or if it's a group, the other group, understand that you want to have a trusting relationship with them. And, and I can't give you a set of words around this that you can use. You have to put it into your own context. You know, if you're a very kind of direct individual, you might actually say to them, hey, we'd get on better together if we had a high degree of trust. You know, I'll be more open with you, you'll be more open with me, and we'll get more out of this relationship together. Others might feel that that's far too direct for them. And then instead, you might give some kind of uh, analogy that explains how a high trust environment is good for people. Whatever words you put around it, you start with making it clear that you want to have that high trust um, relationship with them. And then when you've done that, you can start to signal your behavior. You could say to someone, so when you're dealing with me, here's what you can expect. You know, I'll be transparent with you. If there's going to be a problem, I'll let you know what the problem is. And we can together work out a way around it. And you start to indicate three, four, five different behaviors that they could look for that would indicate when you're operating in a trustworthy fashion. And the thing is that because you've made that very public to them, you've actually declared it, they're going to look for them even more than they would have done otherwise. And then when you do those things, the third thing is when you do what you say you're going to do, they notice it more because you said you're going to do it. And in the back of their mind, this is subconscious brain working. They'll be saying, aha, Gary said he was going to be transparent. He's just talked about something that I didn't know about before that has an Im impact on this. Therefore, he's honoring that commitment that he made. And up goes the trust, another little notch. And it's a really simple process, but it has a significantly big impact on how effective you are at building trust with others. And then, of course, you've got to balance your propensity to trust versus risk. That's that example I gave earlier with my nephew, Craig. You've got to be thinking about what are we walk, working around here? And if it all goes pear-shaped, how big of a risk is that going to be to me, to them, and to the organisation that we're part of, if this is in a, a business context? And then you can put in place checks and balances around it to make sure that you're managing that risk in a controlled way, just like you would in any given uh, project. The next slide, please, Monique. Uh, after that, we're thinking about our sources of power. Where are we going to get our power from? And of course, it isn't about having just one of these. We've all got all of these, but in different measures at different points in time. And they will vary. And the great thing about power, it's not how you see it. The power is in the, behind, in the eyes of the beholder, not in the holder. So it's how other people see your power, not how you see it. And this, again, it's important that you understand who you're dealing with, and then you can try and put yourself in their shoes and consider how they see you. So some of it might come from your brand or your reputation. You've got a reputation for doing the right things in the right way, and therefore people are more likely to acknowledge that if you're suggesting something during a negotiation, it's more likely to be the right outcome, and they're more likely to go in that direction. Some of it might be through your elements of personality, whatever that is made up of. It could be your tenacity to stick with something. It could be your affability so that you're just a likable person and people will be more likely to be uh, resulting in a successful negotiation with those that they like than those that they might not necessarily dislike, but not like as much. Uh, some of it might come from your presence or, or another word for that might be your charisma. Some people are just natural um, leaders and they get listened to more than others but of course they're all they're all variable based on different circumstances sometimes your power might come not so much from you but who you know and you have to be careful with this one because what you don't want to be doing is name dropping so and so said we need to get this negotiated 
because if that name doesn't resonate with that other person that you're trying to negotiate with, that will get you nowhere. And if you use it too much, what that actually says to people is, I'm dealing with someone who's not very confident here. The only way they can negotiate with me is to name drop and they, and they do it all the time. So it, it devalues from your own personal brand. So you, you can consider it, but be, just be careful how you use it. Uh, the next one is a bit similar, um, negotiating from your position. This is your position, your hierarchy within the organization that you may be part of. And the thing to be careful with this is that it actually is not a position of negotiating. It's a position of influence and, it, and you get compliance from people. What you don't get necessarily are willing followers because of your position. They'll do what you want them to do because you've said it and because you're their boss. And if they don't, they know they'll be in trouble. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll do it willingly and they'll do it with their best efforts. They might actually be doing it in such a way that they allow it to fail and then they can turn around afterwards and say, there you are, it was your fault. You told me to do it. So again, be careful about how you use the, the power of position. A great one for us to consider and one for us to all look at how we can evolve is the power we get from our skill sets. So the more you know about negotiating, the more you know about human behavior, the more you know about uh, different styles of influencing, the more you know about communications, the more you practice your in, uh, um, interpersonal skills, that will be a source of power that's transferable across multiple different scenarios. And you can use it again and again, and you can continue to evolve it. And then finally, um, the agenda is about the outcome that you're trying to achieve. If someone else subscribes to that agenda, they're much more likely to be in a position where they'd be willing to negotiate with you and arrive at an outcome because they subscribe to that agenda. They see the benefit in getting the result. If they've got a different agenda, however, that could prevent them. Next thing we need to consider is getting things done in the right sequence. And syntax here, as it says on the slide, absolutely important. Let me give you an example of that. I'll use a, a phrase to do it. Um, the dog bit Gary, we all understand what that means. And there's a syntax or an order to those words that put it into a context and we can relate to it. Now, if I change the syntax, but keep the words the same, we get a suddenly a very different meaning. And you'd also think I was a bit weird because if I changed the syntax and said, Gary bit the dog, it's the same four words, but completely different order and a completely different meaning. So when we're talking about um, the journey here, the ethos is about doing things ethically, allowing people to see that we're coming at this from a position of wanting a win-win outcome, a good thing, a good result for them and a good result for me or us as a team. The next thing is the pathos, is that human connection, demonstrating that you've got empathy, empathy and you understand their negotiating position and you want to help them to be successful. It's just that we're going to have to trade a little bit here to give that joint success for us. And then the final thing is the logic, the logos of that, of that connection. But if you get these in the wrong order, if you present all of the logic, you can leave yourself scratching your head wondering, why wasn't that a successful negotiation? And the reason was because we haven't demonstrated we're approaching it ethically and we haven't made a human connection with them first. And therefore, the logic didn't have anything to connect with. It was just a set of numbers or just a set of words, just a piece of logic, just a group of facts. Next one, please, Monique. Uh, the, the next part is very much uh, the science of, of negotiating, a process for us to follow, the preparation process, then discuss where we both reveal and those negotiating positions. And then based on our understanding of each other's negotiating positions, we can start to do tentative proposals. If you might consider, I would be willing to look at and you're sounding each other out to see where the, the scope is there for some kind of movement. The bargaining is the very much, I'll do X, Y, and Z, and you'll do A, B, and C, because we've now scoped it out and we've understood from our proposals where that, that agreement will land. And then finally, we close by wrapping up and summarizing what we've agreed and documenting that. And the important thing is to document it on some kind of shared whiteboard, if it's virtual or a physical whiteboard, if we're together, because we need to be able to see what we've agreed. Otherwise, if we can't, and I've seen, I've experienced this, but earlier in my career, I was a, a project manager. We were having a big negotiation with um, IBM. They were going to provide us with some new technology. 
we were in a meeting together, we both sides were presenting their arguments forward, primarily uh, the side I was on was arguing about price and they were arguing about all the great features we would have that probably we didn't need in the first place. And eventually we agreed an outcome. And instead of it being documented there and then, the vendor team said they would go away and document it and send it back to us. And when it arrived, you know, you could look at that and you might have thought you were at a completely different meeting. It did not reflect what most of us on the customer side felt had been agreed in that room. And of course, at that point in time, the trust goes out the window, all the barriers come up and you just don't want to deal with that group again. So get it documented uh, using whatever technology that you've got, but get it, get it done together so you can actually see it and finally agree it. Uh, the banner that's talked about on that slide, um, there's no set answer to this, there's no right or wrong, but we do need tucked up our sleeve, a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. What will we do if through our negotiation, we can't reach an outcome that is right for them and right for us? And that goes right the way back to the first part on here, which is your preparation. And when you prepare, I would encourage you to prepare twice, uh, not because you'll get it wrong the first time, and not because it needs practice, but the first time around, prepare from your own perspective. What is it that you do you want? What are you willing to give up? And the secret to a good negotiation is to give up things that are cheap or easy for you to offer, but which are valuable for the other party to receive. And then they'll be trying to do the same with you if they've done their preparation. And um, another tip I would say here is that you're likely to have an advantage over others when you negotiate with them, because many people don't follow this kind of process. They don't see negotiation as something special. So they turn up into a meeting, like we most do to many meetings with very little preparation. And then they'll sit there and try to negotiate off the cuff. And it, they won't necessarily get the right result for themselves. If you've done it well, if you've considered what you can give up and what you can't give up, you'll protect those things that you can't give up. And if someone tries to push you beyond your limit, into those areas of the things that you can't give up, that's when your partner comes in and you can declare, well, in that case, if we can't reach an agreement, this is what I'm gonna do instead. And that gives you a very strong negotiating hand because you'll never get pushed beyond your minimum. So when you're thinking about your preparation, what's, what's the ideal outcome? What's the best case scenario you could possibly consider, which is probably getting all the things that you wanted. And what's the worst case? What's the minimum you would accept but still consider it to have been a successful negotiation. And then you prepare a second time, but trying to put yourself in their shoes. What's their ideal outcome? What's their best case scenario? And what would be their likely minimum? And what you're looking for is an overlap. Because if you've done that preparation from two perspectives, yours and theirs, and they don't overlap, there's a gap. Do not come to the negotiating table. You're, you're not... Either negotiating is not the technique for you or both parties are not yet ready to negotiate. There needs to be more preparation, more time, more consideration over what might be given up. Because if you've got that gap, when you come together, you'll both be trying to push each other beyond the bare minimum. And then you start to feel hard done by. You'll start to feel uh, that the other party's not behaving fairly or ethically. And it will begin to damage that relationship. And that could be a, an irreparable piece of damage. So if it looks like you've got the gap, you need to think creatively about how you might solve it. Next one, please, um, Monique. Uh, some bits now, which is more about it. Um, it says there the science of negotiating. Now, this is about the science of human behavior because people can be predictable in given circumstances. And I'll just touch on the basics of some of these. If you're interested in it, there's a really um, good book by Robert Cialdini and Steve Martin it's actually called Science of Persuasion. And uh, if you haven't got the time to read the book, go onto YouTube and search for The Secrets of the Science of Persuasion. And you'll find uh, around a seven or eight minute video clip that encapsulates the key messages of the book, which is particularly good. Uh, but let's start now going through some of these. So the principle of reciprocation, people are likely more likely to give up a little bit of what they want if they've received something in advance. And I don't mean a gift or a bribe. I'm talking here about you taking the lead, recognizing that negotiation is about a little bit of give and take, 
then in that proposal stage of the five stage negotiation process, offer up something and be the first to offer it. Because when you do that, it'll create a little bit of goodwill. It will show the other party that you're willing to make some compromise and it will then set that in their subconscious mind that they are willing to offer up something in return. Um, the next thing is about the principle of scarcity. People are more conscious about wanting and desiring something if it seems scarce. So if the circumstances permit, you could demonstrate in this negotiation that what you've got to offer is a, is a one-time one deal. Retail companies do this all the time. If you go online, particularly the retail aggregators, if you go on people like booking.com, and you're looking for a hotel room or an event or something, and you'll see pop-ups appearing on the screen saying six people booked this deal in the last five minutes. What they're trying to make you feel is that that deal is scarce. And if you don't act quickly, you're going to lose out on it. And as a result of that, you might be willing to pay a little bit more for it. So they're, they're appealing to an element of human nature that we tend to want more of the things that we feel we can have less of. So when you package up your offering, and you, and you can put it forward in a way that might make it appear an element of scarcity around it. That might help your negotiating stance. But of course, don't forget, we've got to be ethical about this. This is not about dressing it up in such a way that it temporarily makes someone feel like it's a one-time offer. Because when they realise that that was the case, even if it's after the negotiation, you will damage that relationship. Uh, liking is a simple principle. I've already mentioned this before. We are more willing to be influenced by or negotiate with people that we like. So invest in building those relationships. Be a likable person, because it'll actually do you any business. Authority, people are more likely to say yes in a negotiation to those that they consider have a position of authority. The, position, the point of consistency, another part of human behavior, people like to be consistent with the actions of others. So if you are negotiating with someone and you can drop in some kind of anecdote or illustration or story around how others have already negotiated and reached some kind of agreement with you and they're just the last piece in the jigsaw puzzle, they're more likely to agree because they can see that others have already done it. IT vendors do this all the time. They're trying to sell you a product. They want to get a good price for that product. They'll provide you with all these different reports on what other customers have bought from them and they'll give you case studies. So if it was good enough for company X, it must be good enough for you. That's, that's the, it's known as an appeal. That's the appeal they're trying to make to your subconscious mind. And it makes you feel more confident and comfortable in the decision that you reach with them. And then lastly, consensus. Consensus is about showing that uh, others have gone down this route, uh, as, as I've already said, but you can start to indicate the types of others. And if those others are like that individual in, on the basis that you know, they, they'll feel safe and trust others that, who are like them, then you can, you can um, show, that, show that connection to them. So some of these might be useful um, in more cases than others, but it's about thinking about you know, elements of human behavior. Next one, please, Monique. Uh, some other tips. Uh, people have a desperate need to know why. So if you're going to negotiate with them, start with why. Stolen directly from the great Simon Sinek, who's written a book called Start With Why. So if you haven't, again, seen that, I would recommend it. So explain why we need to reach an agreement. What's going to be in it for them? What's going to be in it for the organisation? What's going to be in it for you? If we're looking at, you know, what most of us are in here are a, you know, a project context or a business change context or a service provision context. And so there is a real definite common um, win for us when we're in these scenarios. We all want our service to be successful. We all want to work within the SLAs. We all want our projects to be successful. It doesn't matter if you're on the IT side or the business side, we all want success and we want to be associated with success. So let's start with the why that we need to get this deal agreed. And then when you're into the discussion around that negotiation, significantly avoid uh, disempowering conditional words. Avoid things like might, use the words like will. Don't use things like perhaps. And, and what's interesting here is that when you use those disempowering words, they're often reflecting your inner state of mind. 
So if you're feeling a little bit uncertain, if you're feeling a little bit nervous, what unconsciously comes out as your choice of words are those words of uncertainty. So if you've got an important negotiation to go through, practice it. Think about the words that you use. Think about the phrases that you might bring out. Because when you do that, it won't be the first time that you've ever done it. We tend to be a little bit more nervous about circumstances if we've never done them before. If you've given it a dry run with a colleague and asked, you know, got them to be that awkward project sponsor or the difficult customer and throw back some challenges against you during that little bit of a role play, when you move into the real one, you'll be so much better prepared for it. And then you won't use those disempowering conditional words as much. And if you can, if you've got the opportunity, when you do lead a negotiation, take a colleague in with you, get them, their, their job there is not to say anything, it's just to listen, make some notes, and then after the negotiation, give you some feedback. How did I do? That's gonna be so valuable for you, that extra insight, which you can then use to enhance your own performance next time around. And then try and put yourself in their perspective. I said that already in your preparation, try and do it again in the actual negotiation itself. Watch their facial expressions, take in the, the totality of what is being communicated, not just the words. If someone's frowning, maybe there's, they've got a concern that they haven't shared with you yet, or maybe they just frown. So you're also looking at changes in their pattern of behavior, changes in the pattern of their facial expressions or their body language that give you an insight into how they actually might be feeling at that point in time. And you'll only be able to do that if you've built that, that, that relationship up with them first. If you've met someone for the first time ever, you've got no idea what their baseline is of reactions. So you won't be able to spot the differences. And then uh, next one, please, Monique. I want to give you these with a word of caution, because if we use them wrongly, they can be manipulative and destructive, because some of these things work, again, because we are human beings. We are pre-programmed to respond in certain ways to certain stimuli, and that pre-programming happens when we are probably six months old. That's when it starts. The moment we begin to, to communicate with other human beings. The pre-programming of our responses begins. And so uh, the words like because and now, we are programmed to respond to them in certain ways. Gary, I need you to do this, or I would like this to be the outcome because dot, dot, dot. Suddenly an alert goes on in my mind. I'm, give, I'm now being given a why, and I'm interested in the why. So my, you know, my, concentration levels might go up. I might sit forward in the chair a little bit to really um, focus on what's being said to me. It, it ticks a basic human need. Similarly with the now, it creates in the person's mind a sense of urgency. You know, we might have a project that's two and a half years long and here we are at the front end trying to negotiate either more resource, more time, whatever it might be. And someone's going to be sitting there across the table thinking, ah, don't worry about this, it's two and a half years away. I don't know how, if, if, any, if you've worked on big projects. Suddenly that two and a half years goes by like there's no tomorrow, and then we're up against it and we're looking at a failure because we didn't take the action early. So when we start to not use dates, but use the word now, again, it triggers something in the subconscious and we're much more likely to get that earlier agreement than we would otherwise. Um, sometimes in the negotiation, uh, you know that people don't know something, but they do. if you declare that, it, it, there is a risk of it making them feel uninformed, yeah, potentially even inadequate. And that's the last thing you want to do with someone. You don't want to make them feel, be feeling bad about themselves because the minute they start feeling bad about themselves, that can then um, contaminate their interaction with you. So if you think someone doesn't have a piece of information, don't glow and, and reveal. Use that phrase, you probably already know. You know they don't, but if you say you probably already know and then you give them that extra piece of information, they're more likely to say, oh, yeah, yeah. And you've just filled a gap in their knowledge, which then helps your um, negotiation move forward. Fantastic, big tick in the box. 
you haven't upset them, you've actually enhanced and, and moved the relationship on a little bit. It's only a tiny little nudge, but it's going in the right direction. One I find quite useful, and we've, we've been doing this on a project I've been working on at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm working with an organization, we're putting in place a, a solution for them, and we need to have access to certain things. And there's two ways of doing this. We could ask our teams to provide us with the access, or we could say to them, just give us this little bit of information or just give us your permission, we'll do it all. We can be a light touch customer or, or an interface for you. And that little phrase, I'll do the work for you, you're taking away the grief. Now all you're asking for is permission. And most people won't stand in the way of giving you permission because they'll see it's moving us forward in a good direction and they want that success. The fourth one on there, the using the yes and, much better than the yes but. If you're going to disagree with someone and you say yes but, they may feel like you've overtly knocked down something that they've said and they feel maybe offended by that. If you say yes and, what you're doing is that you're acknowledging what they've said and you're building upon it, whereas a but knocks it out of the way and says, ah, oh, here's, a, here's a better idea. It's a, it's a psychological thing and we don't want to get into the yes, but, no, but, yes, but, no, but, because it gets you nowhere. It gets into an, a, a conflict or an argument, whereas a yes and is additive in the conversation rather than destructive. Imagine is a good technique because it doesn't have constraints. There's no financial constraint. There's no time constraint. There's no resource constraint. There's no technical constraint. You, you know, if you use that, imagine what we could achieve if dot, 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 and then you fill in the blanks. And suddenly what you'll find is that the other parties, whether it's one or, or a group of people, their creative juices start to flow and they'll be wanting now to come up with um, those scenarios that you put that imagine around. And then that primes them for wanting to go into that direction. It creates a, a sense of desire because they're not going to knock down their own imaginations and thoughts. They might knock down yours, but they won't certainly knock down their own. So it primes them for going in a direction, particularly if you've got that uh, imagine phrased around a set of benefits uh, or a what's in it for them. And then finally, if they've got an objection to a proposal that you put forward in a negotiation, acknowledge it. It's a really powerful thing to say, you know what, you're right. If they said, no, you know, that requirement's really important to me. And, and you're trying to, uh, because it's the one you want to get rid of, it's the one you don't really want to do. And you're pushing against it, they're going to probably want to fight even harder for it. But actually, if you said, you know what, you're right, you're right to defend this. And then you can go on to look at other ways of dealing with it. And all of this leads to an individual who is very flexible in their approach to negotiating. They're reflecting the needs of the individuals they're negotiating with, but they're also being authentic. They're being true to the outcome they know they've got to deliver. And they're being, um, they've got that high degree of integrity that they are protecting so that they don't damage the relationship. And this little chameleon survives through being, uh, you know, being able to reflect the environment. You know, if they're being hunted, they can be hard to see. And if they are on the hunt, then they can be hard to see, but they'll capture their prey. And what we want to be is like that little chameleon. We want to be able to reflect our environment, but still be true to ourselves. That little chameleon is a lizard. He can't change being a lizard. He can't become a log or a leaf, but he can look like a log or a leaf. And we want to have that kind of ability because that actually is a real great way of being successful when you're dealing with other human beings, as long as you remain authentic. So um, that's a run through of what we've done. I don't know if there's any questions that have come up. I've not had a chance to look at the chat. Is there much in there? We don't have um, questions in the chat box just yet, but thank you very much for the okay. sharing. I pick up lots of key takeaways. Um, seems that empathy has no conflict with negotiation at all. It's, it's really about how you can find the win-win the so you can do it together and build that relationship and maintain that relationship. And also it's about be, be bold, be the first to, to offer with that certainty as well. So let's move on to the, the discussion. So we've got two work-related like scenarios, each of them we have like around seven minutes 
to 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 have an open discussion. I think we have a, a very good size in the room. So um, I just have read out the the scenario, and everyone can just chip in and mute your, yourself and discuss how you will approach it. Scenario one is about working as a BA or working as an individual. You are on the project. You are managing requirements. There are eight requirements, but because of the estimation and all these, you know that two of the, the requirements will need to be dropped and how you would negotiate with the product owner to pick six requirements from the original eight requirements and what would be your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So as you're thinking about that, something that uh, you might want to keep in your back in the back of your mind is you cannot change the laws of physics. If it's going to take ten more days than you've got available, then it's going to take ten more days than you've got available. It's not about working faster. It's not about working harder. It's not about even working smarter. We cannot change the laws of physics. And if we try to do that. Well, what, what happens if a scientist tries to change the laws of physics? If they try and put something into space that is not going to get up there, what will happen? It's going to crash. And we don't want to crash. It's painful. Any initial thoughts on how you will approach it? What will be the, your first step? This is open to everybody, so feel free to chip in um, what, you know, what you'd normally say, and maybe now what Gary has sort of, uh, in a nutshell, told us, <laughs> um, you know, think about that. I think I'd probably, um, linking to Gary's uh, point about, imagine what the, the case may be, so if we try and take on the... Um, all eight of the requirements, you know, the likelihood is that we're not going to do such a good job. Um, wouldn't it be better to prioritise um, the eight and we, you know, we deliver properly, fully and wholly on the on the six versus not doing such a good job on all the eight? Yeah, that would work well, Mark. Any other thoughts from anyone else? Yes, I think um, it's Sally here. Um, exactly, that was the word I thought of, is prioritise and find a way to help them prioritise. And also, you've got a clue here that you're not necessarily going to fail to deliver them all. It's just which ones do you need now and which can you live without until, say, six months' time or whenever. You know, I mean, the great thing about working in an agile fashion is it wouldn't even be six months time. We're only talking about something that is a matter of weeks away. Yeah. So again, you can draw out the fact that this is not a big delay in the things that they were looking for. Uh, we could certainly um, help them prioritize. We don't just have to say to them, well, what are your priorities? We could offer up ways of prioritizing. Yeah. In an agile project, one of the things that I've done is really simple is you, you know, you, you don't have to put a monetary value on something. You can, you can use, uh, you know, the, the same thing that we would do when estimating. We don't necessarily put hours, days or weeks on there. We use story points. It's a relative size. So why not get the product owner to do a relative size on the value? And then you could simply divide each item of work by the value. Mm -hmm. You divide the story points by the value. You get a number. The bigger the number, the higher the bang for buck. So let's put that at the top of the list and all the other things go lower down the list and then we'll stop when we get to the six that we can complete. And it's a simple value-based prioritization. But you can then you've got the evidence to demonstrate and back it up that it will be maximizing the value that they get. I suppose the other thing to look at is what is the pain of not getting them? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you could you could either you could put a pain score on each one. You can, I mean, you can get quite sophisticated in how you would uh, encourage them to prioritize. Or you could look, you could simply use business logic. 
you know, if, if you're building some functionality for something, some kind of new um, mobile app or web service, yeah, you know, there's, there's not a lot of point of building the, the payments feature if you haven't got the ability to create an account. So there's a business logic that things would have to be done in. And sometimes people don't see that for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they might, they are, you know, it's most, the most important thing for us is to collect money. So we want to get the payments feature done. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's actually not the one they need. It might be the one they want, but as, as, a, as a, someone who's a business analyst, you would know there's a big difference between wants and needs. And sometimes part of the role is helping people understand what that difference is. I think offering to, you mentioned about prioritization and scoring um, and offering to facilitate that session. Or well, here's a, um, and I know you've helped me out with this, Gary, before. You've given me a, a sheet that helps me do it. So, uh, yeah, maybe providing the product owner with, with a, a format to do that prioritization or, or offering to facilitate a session. Yeah. Or, or you know, you're, you're probably all familiar with the, um, the use of the Moscow approach to putting priorities against things that would be another way of doing it then you discover that all, all eight are must-haves <laughs> that's, that's a different negotiation isn't it <laughs> and sometimes part of the negotiation process is to actually educate who you're negotiating with about what things that mean in in the real world because you know there are times that we're dealing with people that don't necessarily understand technology projects the way that we might understand them or business change the way we understand it. And, and part of the relationship building is to give them that deeper insight. And then they'll be grateful for that and then they'll be more willing to negotiate with you in the future. Trying to apply what I've learned from the presentation as well. Is there anything that we think we can give up? Like the things that we think is easy and cheap to, to offer that it will be really valuable to the product owner so we can kind of make, make them feel that we, we are trying to accommodate as much as well. That's an interesting one to me because one thing that I quite often find myself dealing with and doing a bit of education is that something that to a user or a product owner might sound complicated is actually quite easy to deliver and vice versa so you might actually be able to pick on something that you know is going to be valuable and as you say it's going to be a much easier thing to accomplish that makes sense any final thoughts on this scenario before we, we move on to the next one I mean, in, in this final one, uh, oh, sorry, in this one, the, the final step on there, the Batman, the best alternative to, nego to negotiated agreement. If you can't reach an agreement, you're still going to have to make progress. And it isn't just about saying, oh, well, we'll have to try. We'll do our best. We'll see if we can get all 10, uh, oh, sorry, all eight done. Because as Mark said, you won't. And in fact, what might be worse is that instead of delivering six out of eight, you end up doing nothing. None of them are complete because you've spread that resource thinly and they just don't succeed in anything. So the best alternative might be, you know what, I'll, I would put, I'll do a bang for buck, I'll do some weighted shorty job first, I'll do some kind of Moscow and I'll pick the six. If you're unable to do it, leave it with me, I'll do the work for you, I'll prioritise it and I'll make it happen. And then you can have the following two requirements in two weeks time, four weeks time, whenever because that prevents that failure. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Scenario two. So this is about, for example, as a BA or uh, as a person working on a waterfall project and you have 18 months to go, um, you realize that you need 21 months rather than 18 months to finish all the requirements. So how would you negotiate with the the sponsor about perhaps time, cost, quality, and also what would be your best, best alternative as well? This is could be potentially tougher because 
people's perception is 21 months is a long time away. Well, 18 months is a long time away. So surely you'll be able to catch it up. Whereas when things are only two weeks away, there, there isn't that same perception, perception of catching it up or working a little bit harder. It's very much in the immediate future. Uh, here, it can be tough to convince people that we need to make these decisions now because we will reap the benefits later. Can't you just cut a little bit off of each one, they'll say. Do less testing is a common response. Or let's do some things in parallel when you know full well that they are um, finished start dependencies. And when you do them in parallel, it will just knock your wrist through the roof. I think there's the other one about throwing more people at it. Well, it, it might work. It might work, but there are times when you, no matter how many people you throw at it, it doesn't get it done any quicker. Mm. It's, it's, again, it's about understanding what are the laws of physics in this context and which things can I flex and which things can't I flex. And that's all part of that preparation. You know, the, for this kind of scenario, that five stage process pays off big time. But it will take a little bit more effort to, to, to go through and follow. You know, we could reduce the scope. We could just say, well, you know, we'll agree to give it longer. They might be disappointed about that, but it comes down to, do you want a successful project or do you want a failure? If you're the sponsor of a project, do you want to be the sponsor of the project that failed? Or do you want to be the sponsor of the project that succeeded and everyone's happy with? Do you want to be the sponsor that delivers benefit or misses benefit? And that, that might sound a little bit controversial, but maybe they're not looking at it in that fashion right now. And helping them see the reality of the situation uh, might be that one trigger that prompts them to be more, more willing to negotiate. If you agree to, you know, if you agree, oh, well, we'll we'll try and get it done in the 18 months then. And then you go back and you communicate that with your colleagues on the team. How are they going to be feeling about this? They feel like they've just been stitched up completely. And therefore their motivation to deliver is now lower. They're not going to work harder. Their motivation to deliver is less than it was five minutes ago. When they thought they were might they might just have a chance of getting 21 months out of you. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. What else could we do with this? So we looked at reducing the scope, giving it longer. I think a suggestion came up for increasing the resources or spend to try and get it done in that, that lesser time. Position the overrun. Position the overrun as the best uh, the best approach. To your point, it may not be possible to bring it in uh, to bring in more resources or to reduce the scope. Um, so position the benefits of of adding the three months um, to the plan. Yeah, because at the end of the day, from a business perspective, it's about it, as as Mark was led there. It's about reaping those benefits, whether it's a cost reduction, a revenue increase. A profit a productivity gain uh, we're all about making that kind of change happen we want to get the benefits as uh, in the time frame that we were looking for and if we try and deliver something in a lesser time and it fails it might not just now be 21 months to put it right it might be 28 months to put it right and now the benefits have been compromised we might be better off saying okay let's stretch it to 21 we'll get the benefits in 20 month, 21 months time rather than 18. It's not ideal, but it's it's better than even longer. How many times, I've, I've seen this loss, where organisations never have enough time to do it right, but they've always got enough time to do it again. One company I did some work with, uh, I won't mention their name, um, but you've I'm sure you've engaged with them at one point in your life. And there was a Big, big project that they had, uh, major systems replacement, and they did it three times in 10 years. And so the first two iterations of it were never in place long enough to get any of the benefit that they should have delivered before it was upended and moved on to the next iteration because they didn't get it right first time. Yeah, I think particularly in this scenario, 
it did mention but we just finished the requirements definition phase so that means we are sort of still at the early stage of the the process so i think that there should still be quite a bit of room to really talk about this in a transparent manner rather than oh you have already halfway through or you have like one third of a time left and you realize you haven't really have complete all the have features or requirements that the the whole project is meant to deliver so i think um maybe timing wise is still kind of a, uh is a good point to discuss as well it may even present an opportunity to really reconsider the whole approach to the project because you're so early in the life cycle and that might be the thing that could manage to deliver all of the requirements in the required time it's interesting that point because i was just starting to think what assumptions have you made so have you assumed that that um, certain people will build something when you could buy it off the shelf from somewhere else other things you can cut down on the time with isn't it? where you know but the buy not build is a, yeah. sometimes a very quick way to solve these types of problems that the uh, business users or project sponsors may not have considered for themselves because they, it's always been done a certain way that's good any other thoughts on the, the scenario before we go into Q&A or any questions in general on negotiation? Anyone? No. Okay, right. So in that case, um, thanks so much, Gary, for, for your sharing. I think that's, that's really amazing. I learned so much. Where's Gary? Have we lost him? Uh, I think we lost Gary. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but probably this is the sign that time is up. Okay. Um, I'll just come. I'm sure he'll come back in. Yeah, he'll, he'll come back. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. back. Here we go. Too eager, Gary. Is Gary yeah. muted? Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. I um, right. Zoom dropped. That's okay. I was just thanking you, and then I realized you're not there. <laughs> How shocking that is. So yeah, but thank you so much for, for sharing your, your insights and what us through your thought process on the scenarios as well. I think that that has been really good. I learned so much, and I, I hope the, the audience learned a lot as well. If you could kindly fill in the, the survey, is there the same link? Um, that would be really helpful to, to let us know how you find the presentation today so I'll, I'll share the link again here and just you know we have the the next event schedule so it's going to be 21st of september adam hall from and digital will come to present his thoughts on gun charts a quick show of hands has anyone used gun chart before cool okay and what's your your experience with gun chart <laughs> <laughs> we all hate them <laughs> yeah, Adam is going to, to share with us this. He doesn't like Gantra as well. He, he felt it's quite a horrible thing. It's, it may not really be serving the, the purpose. So he is going to share with us his thoughts on alternative to Gantra. So I think that will be a very good sharing. And we may learn some kind of good tricks or maybe you can challenge Adam on I have an even better alternative to gun charge and to, to his proposal as well. So please do join us for the September event. And I just put the link, a feedback link. Uh, it's the same uh, manti.com link. So if you could join and share with us the uh, feedback, that would be very helpful. It's just a, a one minute um, survey. So yeah, so thanks so much everyone for, for joining the event. I, I won't keep you for, for longer, but I will stay here if you want to to do some networking with the community. Thank you so much for, for joining and I'll see you next time. And thank you, Gary. Brilliant. Thank I'll you, Millie. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like you need to stick around just for me. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. okay. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.